A computer virus is a type of malicious software that is capable of self-replication, embedding itself into the code of other programs, system memory areas and boot sectors, as well as distributing its copies through various communication channels. This is Eugene Kaspersky, the very individual who founded Kaspersky Lab. For 21 years, he has been waging war against cyber criminals and is likely, even now, contemplating our security. As we go about our daily lives using our laptops and phones, a real hunt unfolds for our information. Hackers devise increasingly complex viruses, while those combating them develop ever more sophisticated defenses. This battle is hierarchical. At the base are the most common threats we encounter daily, worms, trojans, phishing emails, and the majority of internet attacks. Above these are targeted attacks, aimed at specific individuals or organizations. At the pinnacle is the novelty of our century, cyber weapons. Each hacker decides which niche to occupy, initiating an endless battle with cybersecurity specialists. These are ordinary men and women who play a relentless game of cat and mouse with hackers, a true war that escalates with each passing year. What happened before pales in comparison to the latest attacks and investigations? Most attacks are not targeted at anyone in particular. Typically, Trojans and phishing emails roam the net indiscriminately. Their victims are those who have not taken steps to secure their safety or enhance their cyber literacy. For instance, an email arrives claiming to contain photos from a recent party, possibly explicit, sent on a Monday to those who recently attended a party, leading them to believe the email was meant for them. Upon opening the email and downloading an attachment, nothing happens. The infected individual assumes it's a mistake and forgets about it, only to later discover a depletion of funds or complete data erasure, with no clue as to how it occurred. It's akin to a zombie movie where the protagonist ends up infected without knowing when the bite occurred. In reality, it all happens due to a line of code that launches a malicious macro from the email. The variety of phishing attacks is vast. It's like fishing. Cast your nets into the lake, bait the fish, and wait for them to swim into the trap. I, too, have fallen for such bait. I received an email asking for verification of my Instagram page. Following the link, I saw a typical Instagram login page. Nothing seemed amiss, so I entered my password, and when nothing happened, I tried again, only then realizing I had been infected. How foolish of me not to notice the website address. This attack, known as a homograph attack, exploits the vulnerability of browsers to PuniCode, a method for converting sequences of Unicode characters into the ASCII character set permitted in domain names. Unfortunately, many alphabets contain characters that look identical to their Latin counterparts. For example, in March 2018, cybercriminals attempted to rob users of the well-known cryptocurrency exchange, Binance. Prior to the incident, the criminals conducted a series of successful phishing campaigns, collecting login credentials from numerous users through fake domains, mimicking the real Binance domain. Having one's account compromised is an unpleasant event. The good news is that cyber literacy is on the rise. Today, not everyone will click on suspicious links from emails or SMS messages like, you've received 21,684, click here quickly, and remember to watch what happens on your screen. A virus downloaded via a link in an SMS or WhatsApp message can overlay apps and request your bank card details. Okay, people are becoming more literate, but the bad news is that hackers understand this too and have started to adapt. Drive-by downloads represent a new type of attack. Now you don't need to download anything. Simply visiting a web page can infect you. This happens if your programs, like browsers, are not up to date. Hackers exploit these vulnerabilities to execute their code unnoticed. Using apps is safer than websites. Developers incorporate several checks into them, but as more potential victims use their phones, the temptation to attack them increases. Despite the challenges, our phones are the first thing we see in the morning and the last thing at night. 40% of people take their phones to the bathroom, and 22% use them in the bath or shower. Previously, Fraudsters could only extract about $5 from a phone account through calls and SMS under various pretexts. Now, with banking apps installed, they can steal much more. There are many methods. One is fake apps, often masquerading as popular messengers, cryptocurrency apps, music apps, 
or even real games advertised by Let's Players worldwide. But the phone app turns out to be a fake. Fraudsters hire whole teams of programmers, designers, layout artists, and managers to precisely replicate the game. You open the app, play, and can't tell the difference. It's a real production, just on the dark side. Google Play and App Store are considered quality, trusted sources by many, which encourages fraudsters to devise more sophisticated schemes of deception. One striking example is the Ancestry Lookup app, which purports to help users find their ancestors. You enter a name, date, and place of birth, and the app asks you to place your finger for scanning to find your great-grandfather. It suggests downloading your biometrics to compare with those of your ancestor, a seemingly logical request. However, most people don't stop to think that our distant relatives never submitted their biometrics. Before they know it, they've purchased a VIP version of the app for 83 pounds. Naturally, such apps rank in the top 100 on the App Store for revenue. They include weather forecasts, QR readers, wallpapers, ringtones, etc., all with fake reviews and ratings. Some don't even involve malicious activity. They simply start charging you around $40 a week after a three-day trial, amounting to $2,080 a year for minimal functionality. The secret lies in the fact that 99% of people don't read the user agreement. I understand. Reading through those pages each time is a Herculean effort. But applications ready to charge you some amounts aren't the worst that can happen. The real danger arises if you grant an app root access. You might not think much of it and agree, giving the app complete control over your smartphone's internal functions. A hacker could then covertly take photos of you, record your conversations, track your location, intercept your messages, and more. Especially if your device is older and more vulnerable to attacks. It's not difficult to boost an app's rating if you can harness the work of 10,000 phones. This is the business model of click farms in China. Departments within Google Play and the App Store are dedicated to combating such apps, but that doesn't mean we're entirely safe. Consider the case of Get Contact, which intrigued many with the prospect of seeing how they were labeled in others' phones. The result was millions of leaked phone numbers with names. It was a brilliant scam. Each person inadvertently shared the numbers of 200, 300 acquaintances. Subsequently, those individuals received calls from advertisers offering products or services. There are services nobly offering to delete your number from their database. You enter your number and confirm the deletion, but there are no guarantees it will happen. Even after a hacker has harvested all your personal data, your smartphone remains useful. You're incorporated into a botnet, an army of bots, becoming the hacker's personal zombie unwittingly. In other words, the hacker uses your computing power for tasks like mining cryptocurrency. If your owner is a major player in the black market, you might even become a pawn in DDoS attacks, often depicted in movies. This works as follows. At any given moment, the hacker can command their bot army to crash a website like the New York Times. The hacker sends the order from their command center and the bot army floods the site. The site can't handle the overwhelming traffic. The larger the bot army, the more expensive the hacker's services. The Mirai botnet, which linked 300,000 devices worldwide in 2016, not only included smartphones and computers, but also DVRs, cameras, and even toasters. One of the infected zombies' phones exploded from the load during a cryptocurrency mining operation. Such viruses are easily contracted by downloading pirated software. You run the installation file, which ends with a virus that then disguises itself within your system. If a user launches a resource-intensive game, smart mining programs pause their operation. But suppose you're smarter than all this. You've prohibited online purchases, avoid dubious websites, don't use the internet much and only make cash withdrawals from ATMs. Despite these precautions, one day, you might receive an SMS alerting you that someone is withdrawing your money in Beijing. You contact your bank to block your card, but it's too late. The funds have been withdrawn halfway across the world. Remember that ATM in the unfamiliar alley you used once? There was something off about it that you didn't notice. The card reader was protruding a skimming device installed by hackers to read your card's magnetic stripe and transmit the data. Banks have responded by creating anti-skimming devices, but ironically, these look similar to skimmers themselves, making bank customers wary. Now, 
They're made transparent to show there are no hidden scanners, wires, or boards inside. However, hackers have found ways to disguise skimmers so well that the only way to check is to try and detach the device, a high-risk move since skimmers can be installed in seconds. Careless installation might leave clues like glue residue, a covered part of the logo, or a slight gap, but these won't help if the skimmer is inserted directly into the card slot. What about your pin? A hidden camera or an overlay keypad could record everything you type, transmitting the keystrokes to the real keypad to avoid raising suspicion. In some instances, fraudsters might completely replace the ATM's faceplate. After acquiring the necessary data, they manufacture a duplicate of your card and withdraw money wherever they please. Skimming will persist as long as we continue to use bank cards. However, some criminals take it a step further by hacking the ATMs themselves. You might have seen depictions of such feats in movies like Batman, where desperate individuals attempt to break into ATMs using crowbars. This might be their first attempt at such a heist. Terminals are less secure, but ATMs weigh tons and contain steel safes several inches thick. Yet every year, someone tries to break them open. Against an excavator, for instance, there might be little defense. For a long time, it seemed that the banking system was highly secure. However, a few years ago, the executives of a Ukrainian bank turned to Kaspersky Lab. Upon noticing that an individual was withdrawing money from an ATM without using a bank card or entering a PIN code, how? Such individuals are known as mules. Their role is to collect the money dispensed by ATMs. They represent the final link in the cybercrime group, Carbonac. But what does the entire group consist of? At the helm are several individuals, a database expert, a banking system reconnaissance specialist, a programmer who wrote the hacking code, a cleaner who erases digital traces, and a fisher who sends out the emails. Together, they form a well-organized criminal cyber group. The virus code is packaged into attachments and sent by the fisher to bank accountants. The email subjects and attachment names are made clickbait-worthy to entice recipients. Opening the file means unleashing the malicious code. The virus then spreads through the bank's internal network over two to four months, infiltrating servers that control the ATMs. The code sets the precise time and location for cash dispensing, and at the appointed moment, a mule appears at the ATM. The money is then passed through intermediaries who convert it into cryptocurrency and vanish. But that's not all. The virus was so powerful that it could artificially inflate account balances. Remember art money? It was a program used by gamers to cheat by increasing in-game currency. The principle was the same. Hackers would turn 1,000 into 10,000, withdrawing 9 out of 10,000 without any account movement being detected. Using this scheme, hackers managed to withdraw up to $12 million a day, affecting about 100 organizations. After the operation, the cleaner would erase all digital traces in the bank's systems. In this way, they defrauded banks of $1.2 billion, marking the largest digital robbery in history. Previously, we learned about such criminals from news bulletins. Now one can simply visit the social media profiles of the Spanish Minister of the Interior to see the arrest of the group's leader, Denis Katana Tokarenko. The operation was led by a Russian man of modest height, living in Spain with his wife and son. He was more active online, spending his nights on the laptop rather than enjoying the famous San Juan beach. The hackers earned a billion dollars by exploiting human vulnerabilities knowing that some employees would open infected emails. However, they failed to consider that their own people could also make mistakes. In Taiwan, one of the mules lost his credit card at an ATM, leading the police to identify him and subsequently arrest members of the group one by one. Kaspersky Lab took on the investigation of the attack, being the first to identify the malicious program, conduct an investigation, and reconstruct the hacker's actions. The digital world we inhabit seems so convenient, yet it brings with it new threats that we must guard against. Nowadays, even toasters and refrigerators can be used in DDoS attacks. Stay vigilant. Thank you for watching the video. If you have questions, write them in the comments. And also check out our channel, we have some more interesting videos.